では皆様お時間となりましたのでこれより受講者の皆様よりご講演を頂戴したいと存じますはじめにサブサハラアフリカにおける稲の林欠乏への対処と題しましてトボヘリー・ラコトソン様にご講演いただきますラコトソン様よろしくお願いいたしますはい。And、uh, the presentation will comprise the, the following points. And let's start immediately to see what's the context of rice production in Sub Saharan Africa. And for that, I will take the case of Madagascar and as an example case of、uh, Sub Saharan African countries. Rice is a very important food item in Madagascar. Madagascar is at the moment the fourth rice producer in the continent in Africa. And、uh, where farmers are mostly rice producers, and also most of the, the farmlands are occupied by、uh, lowland rice fields. In Madagascar, rice is the staple food of the population, and for them, meal without rice is not a meal. However, rice produ production has been low and not enough for decades. And has not been able to meet the local demand, and that's mainly because of low rice yields. And because of that, to fill the gap, the government has been importing rice at a price much more higher than the local price. And the situations have been causing a huge, serious food insecurity, a huge, huge loss of current, foreign currency in the countries. And this rice problem and involved in rice in the economy also is also the same situation. For the other、uh, sub Saharan African countries. Numerous are the causes of、uh, the low yield and low rice production in Madagascar, but phosphorus deficiency is among the, the main、uh, limiting factors, and that's mostly because of the soil type where rice is grown,、uh, because of the, low,、uh, the, the high content of iron and、uh, aluminum oxides in soils, which, is, which type of soil is everywhere in Madagascar. Phosphorus deficiency can cause, can cause a considerable、uh, loss of、uh, biomass and the later on a considerable loss of yield. Plant roots can take up、uh, only the available phosphorus from the soil solution, which is supplied by the, soil from the,、uh, by the phosphorus coming from the soil, soil solid phase, but also by the phosphorus coming from the fertilizers. However, those aluminum and iron oxide, which are present in large quantity in the soils, can strongly or reversely fix the phosphorus that is added or, or the phosphorus which is already present in the soil. Although there is a high total concentration of phosphorus in the soil, only a very small amount is available to be taken up by the plant roots. And The, the problem, that problem of phosphorus deficiency is exacerbated by the low use of mineral fertilizer by the farmers. And to tackle this problem of phosphorus deficiency, we adopted two strategies. And the first one is the use of organic material to really see if we can unlock or solubilize those phosphorus which are already present in the soil solid phase. And the second strategy was the use of the,、uh, the micro dose of. NPK fertilizers in the plant nursery, nursery bed, as we can see in the picture throughout the rice cropping、uh, process. And this, it is to be noted that it's a、uh, localized application of fertilizer, so only a small amount is required. Let's see first,、uh, the, first the research theme, which is the use of organic materials.、Uh, organic materials have been known in general to increase the solubility or the avail availability of phosphorus in soils. Through different various me mechanisms, but our focus was mainly in the first, into the, the first point, point which,、uh, with the microbial reduction of iron oxide, 
which is expected to solubilize more phosphorus into the soil, in the paddy soils. So our question was to know whether adding more organic material either as far as material as you can see in the picture, compost or rice, rice straw, which are uh, materials available among the small former fa small older farmers, can improve, further improve the solubility or the availability of phosphorus in waterlogged soils or in paddy soils. And uh, we used the isotope tracing technique throughout our experiments because the quantification of uh, soil available phosphorus is difficult in phosphorus deficient soils. And this consists of uh, labeling the soil available phosphorus priorly and then have them uh, assessed with soil or the E value or assessed in plant or the L values. And this method offers a more accurate assessment of the soil available phosphorus, but also it can help the identification or the quantification of the different uh, phosphorus sources of phosphorus taken up in plants, either from soil or from the fertilizer. The first experiment that we did was an incub incubation experiment with six different petty soils incubated non-waterlogged or waterlogged with and without rice straw addition. And we used the isotope technique here, or the e-values for, and the, the, the figure is one, here is one of the most responsive soils where we can see that between uh, non-rice straw addition and rice straw addition for both waterlogged treatment, we can see that there is an increase of uh, the isotope or the soil available phosphorus due to rice straw addition but this increases much more larger than the quantity of phosphorus that is already brought up by the rice straw, confirming that application of rice straw or as organic material can solubilize more phosphorus into soil solution. And next, to confirm that rice plants can benefit from this phosphorus solubilization, we conducted a different pot experiment with farmyard manure as organic material and also with P treatments as TSP, and again with six different soils with contrasting, contrasting properties. And here we can see the shoot biomass of two different soils, and we confirm that with farmyard manure application, the green one, we can increase the shoot biomass of the rice compared to no farmyard manure application. But this effect can be only seen in soil with low pH and low carbon content. And then, from that previous pot experiment, we selected three soils to, um, and used the isotope method or the, e value, the L values this time to see the different uh, uh, source of phosphorus that is taken up in the rice plants. And we can, we can, we can see in the figure that the P taken up of the plant can be subdivided in two, the P from the soil and the P from the fertilizer. Here, the fertilizer are TSP and farmyard manure. And we clearly see that with the, the animation that the phosphorus that is origi originated from the soil is always higher under the treatment of farmyard manure application, as we can see in the, the green colored uh, bars. And we confirm that farmyard manure application or organic material can um, allow to use of the locked or the insoluble phosphorus in the soil and can also enhance the phosphorus uptake by the rest plants. And all of these previous findings were tested and confirmed in a field exp experiment in Madagascar where we used different uh, doses of farmyard manure and also in different uh, fields in the central alliance of Madagascar. And we confirmed that the use of farmyard manure application can increase the phosphorus availability, which is reflected by the phosphorus uptake here, but that effect can only be seen in field with low phosphorus availability or in field with um, um, uh, high phosphorus deficiency. And then that we come to the second uh, research theme, which is the NPK microdosing. We have seen earlier that um, farmers only use a very small amount of fertilizers. In the, in, 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 that's their current practice. And um, we tried to cope with that by applying the small fertilizer, a small dose of, of fertilizer applied in the nursery. Here, we used an equivalent dose of six gram of phosphorus per square meter with different mineral organic 
and mineral and organic sources. And then the, the seedlings were afterwards uh, transplanted in main fields with different uh, schemes of fertilizer, but which include the, the actual, uh, uh, the current um, farmer's practice, which is mostly no fertilization or a small amount of urea. And then among the different nursery treatments, we uh, observed that the seedlings grown from the NPK microdoses are more, much more vigorous than the other seedlings in the other treatments. And after they were transplanted in the main field, um, we, we observed that the seedlings from this NPK microdoses produced, produced much more grain yield than the other treatments, but also it allowed more um, economical benefit for the farmers. And although um, it was not uh, uh, able to completely substitute the, the, the main field fertilization, we suggested it as, we, we suggested it as a uh, start point for agriculture intensification. And to summarize the main findings, we have seen first that uh, organic materials can help access or solubilize the fixed phosphorus in the soils, and also it can improve the phosphorus availability and the grain yield for rice, but it has to be used in uh, very low uh, uh, availability of phosphorus. And the second, uh, we saw also that the NPK micro microdosis in plant nursery can improve the rice yields and benefit for uh, small farmers and it can be used as starting point for intensifications. And this research, as our findings have, have been uh, proposed as strategies for sustainable phosphorus management for rice in sub-Saharan Africa, and is now published in field crop research. And uh, for my future research vision, I would like still to work on the, the soil fertility and to help the small farmers access uh, man better manage the fertilizer management, and for that, uh, my focus will would be on the nutrient nutrient or fertilizer recycling, with the identification of nutrient cycles at different farm and uh, field levels, but taking into account as well the soil and plant interactions. And I would like to acknowledge the people for which whom I've been working to to do my research and also the. That who allows me to be continuing to do research at the moment. And this includes a lot of people, many people, including the big team of Cherkas, and my former and my present colleagues at the moment. And uh, on that, I make an end to my presentation. Arigato gozaimasu. Makoto Sonsama, arigato gozaimashita. Arigato gozaimashita. では続きまして中外抵抗性強化を含む世界的な小麦の遺伝学的改良と題しましてレオナルド・クレスポー・ヘレラ様にご講演いただきますクレスポー・ヘレラ様どうぞよろしくお願いいたしますグッドモーニングエブリワン First I would like to start thanking the panel of the 2022 Japan International Award for Young Agricultural Researchers for selecting me. I'm on the recipients of this very prestigious recognition, and I would also like to thank the entire team of the Global Wheat Program at CIMIT, because without their support and encouragement, I think I wouldn't be standing here today. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to start saying that um, Wheat uh, helps to feed the world. It provides about 20% uh, of our calorie intake in our diets. Uh, it's consumed for, on about uh, 170 countries. And about 25% uh, of the global production takes place in low and low middle income, income countries. 53% uh, is consumed in Asia of the global production. If we look at the graph uh, since 1960s, uh, there are two things we, uh, I, would like to, I would like you to focus on. Is one thing is that uh, uh, since those years and the emergence or the development of semi-dwarf uh, wheat varieties in which the germplasm from Japan actually played a very significant role for that event because uh, that was the origin of the dwarfing genes in wheat. 
Since then, uh, you can see that the harvested area has not changed too much, really. It more or less has remained constant. And the production, the volume of production has increased uh, constantly. Uh, the problem is that in the last decade, this increase has been only at the rate of 1.3%. And if we want to double yields by 2050, this rate should be at least 2% for about uh, 60 kilos, uh, 70 kilos sorry, uh, per hectare per year. And it's in this sense in which uh, wheat breeding can play a very important role, of course, not alone, but also with the help of good agronomic practices and, and the right policies. Uh, but I will talk about, uh, more about uh, wheat breeding today. Uh, wheat breeding at CIMIT, uh, uh, the International Mason Wheat Improvement Center, which is based in Mexico, uh, we target around 60 million hectares of wheat that is grown globally. And this is uh, thanks to the geographical position of Mexico, uh, that we can have two crop cycles a year. In the northwestern part of Mexico, we can evaluate uh, wheat materials for high yield potential and simulate different environments that correlate with the performance of varieties in, in many places in the world. And in the central part of Mexico, we can evaluate for many diseases and we can combine these evaluations uh, with uh, other observations that we make uh, in Kenya for another important disease that is called stem rust. And after we go through our breeding process, uh, our materials, our elite materials get distributed uh, in different countries to different collaborators in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And this data that they return to us also help us to make breeding decisions. When we talk about wheat breeding, we focus m mostly in five major things. One is the uh, high yield potential. We need to increase high yield potential because that will help us to increase productivity. And yield stability. Yield stability is fundamental, is paramount for uh, farmers uh, because uh, when they face, face events of heat and drought, they would like to have varieties that can adapt to those conditions. Durable disease resistance is important because that also contributes to, contributes to the stability of uh, the germplasm or the varieties. Enhanced nutritional quality, uh, mainly in the form of high iron and zinc content in the grains, uh, mainly targeting uh, the population that uh, suffers for malnutrition in South Asia. Uh, and of course, uh, we need uh, wheat varieties that have uh, an adequate end use quality. That means that the consumers can elaborate or the right product, products can be elaborated for the consumers. Uh, and of course, wheat production ha can have several constraints. Uh, and uh, I will focus now on in, uh, insects and pests in particular uh, in the context of climate change. With climate change, we know that the insects or the pests will tend to uh, adapt or move to new geographies, particularly those geographies in which the minimum temperature uh, is just a little bit below the minimum requirements of the insects. Uh, this will lead to the earlier, inf earlier infestations of pests, particularly in, in areas where uh, spring wheat is sown on winter months. And inevitably, this may lead to the increase of use in ins insecticides. Actually, if, if we look at, at the data of the insecticide use in agriculture, in this century, the, it, is, it has increased about 13%. And then there are several millions of reported cases of unintentional uh, poisoning because of the mishandling of the insecticides. Uh, and of course, uh, if farmers, they, have, uh, they don't have access to insecticides, they, 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 they are under the risk of uh, increasing yield loss. There are reports in which uh, if we assume a scenario of two degree uh, average increase in the, uh, or two degree increase in the average temperature, the yield loss due to insects uh, or pests can be anything between 8% or almost 14% in different regions of the world. My work uh, focused mainly on two aphid species. Uh, one is called Schisaphis graminum. The other one is called uh, Ropalocifum pade in Latin names. Uh, but uh, I like to call them Greenbuck and Bercherio aphid. It's easy, easier at least. And these aphids are important because they can uh, reduce yield by about 40% or 30% in when they are not controlled. And they can also transmit viral diseases. But when we want to incorporate insect resistance to 
uh, into a wheat breeding program, uh, there are a lot of things that we need to consider because uh, there are things when you are doing breeding that you wouldn't like to sacrifice to incorporate another trait. We don't want to lose or we don't want to lose progress, genetic progress, when we want to incorporate another trait in a full breeding package. And of course, this requires the identification of genetic diversity because without uh, genetic resources, we cannot, we cannot do breeding. And together with this is the need of uh, having the uh, uh, special selection tools so we can, uh, uh, during the breeding process, we can select the material that uh, we consider is resistant. Now I will, I will talk about the, what we have found in uh, terms of identifying uh, resistance to the Greenbach or the Birch, or Eschisaphis graminum. As you can see in the picture the, uh, that you have on your left, uh, the, the damage of this aphid uh, makes that the plants become yellow and, uh, when they are susceptible. But when the plants are resistant, the plants uh, remain green. So this tells us that uh, there is, um, in, the, in the resistant plants, you can observe that there is a still a chlorof the chlorophyll content in the plants uh, maintains, even though the aphids are feeding on them. And what we have, uh, oh. oh, sorry. What we have uh, identified is that um, by measuring chlorophyll, you can identify, of course, resistant germoplasma, but also because of this visual feature of the damage of the symptoms of the plants that they display when they the aphids feed on, you can also um, assign a, a visual score and then determine which plants are resistant or susceptible. With these two uh, traits, let's say, we were able to identify uh, genomic regions in the, on the chromosomes of wheat uh, that associate with, uh, with the resistance. Uh, through our breeding efforts, we have uh, developed around 1,000 uh, adapted lines of wheat that uh, we, we took them a step further uh, beyond the identification. And that is, the, we, we, conduct, we conducted further uh, genetic studies, and then we found that there are several uh, regions in the wheat chromosomes, on the wheat chromosomes that uh, are associated to the, to the resistance. Then we have the other aphid species, which is called uh, Ropalocyphum padae, or the bird cherry oat aphid. Uh, this aphid is very different because it does not cause visual symptoms. You cannot see the damage until the plants are really dead or are, are stunned completely. So we don't have any other way to measure resistance. Uh, well, there, are, there could be other ways, but the, the way we do it is that uh, uh, when we measure the growth reduction of the plants when the aphids feed on them or the biomass loss. And we have, we have found that there, are, uh, there is genetic variation for that. So the plants that have less growth reduction and less biomass low, loss on, the, on their aphid feeding, we call those resistant. And we have found that also um, this resistant uh, is present in the A and B genomes of, the, of, the, of wheat. And also uh, through different types of strategical crossing, you can get uh, wheat right translocations. And then we have found also uh, resistance on those materials. Similarly to the Greenbach, we did uh, a genome-wide association study, in, and we found that there are several, all those small triangles that you see are uh, small markers, uh, DNA markers, that are associated to the resistance. Uh, and then we found that uh, there, are, there are several other, several genes that can be associated to the, to the resistance to this aphid. Yet, uh, we, we went a step further on these results, and then we wanted to predict the performance of the lines. We want to see if through the uh, availability of the genomic information and the phenotypic information, the observation that we have on the plants, we can predict the performance of the material. And we found that uh, this accuracy of the prediction, uh, that's how it is evaluated, based on the accuracy of the observed versus the predicted values, it can be between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. And this is encouraging because uh, that tells us that these new te technologies or tools for selecting in breeding programs uh, can be implemented in breeding for this characteristic. 
But so far, these results just apply for seedling uh, tests. And then at the end of the day, what we want is that uh, we want to see those resistance sources uh, to be effective in the field. We want to see how much this resistance protects the plants from losing yield. And we established uh, some field trials uh, for a few years. And, and you, as you can see in the graph on the left, uh, that depicts the development of aphid population throughout time. Each line of, the, of that graph represents a different uh, plant genotype or a plant line or source of resistance. And you can see that there are differences. There are lines that have or uh, display or de depict uh, less aphids uh, throughout the crop cycle. And there are other lines that have much more aphids throughout the crop cycle. But if you go to the field and you want to evaluate aphids and count aphids, it's very time consuming. So another thing that we did was to uh, evaluate the reflectance of the plants and see if we can uh, correlate any of these uh, characteristics uh, with the aphid population. And then we found a spectral fe features of the reflectance uh, on the plants uh, in different uh, wavelengths that can be correlated uh, to the aphid population. Uh, one, one, one of the things uh, from these experiments is that we found, we found genotypes that can protect yield almost by 0% to 6-7%. This is very important. That's, that means that uh, these sources can work, work in the field under field conditions and then uh, you, to some extent you can help the farmers to produce wheat more sustainably by reducing the, the, the use of insecticides, which is one of the main objectives. Uh, in the, in the, photo, the photograph that you see on your right, the left uh, side of the photograph represents a susceptible plot or susceptible genotype, which, as you can see, it's yellow. Uh, it's diff oh, okay, it's a little bit yellow and plants are dead, but the, the, the plants that are on the right side of the photograph remain green and healthy. All this material was evaluated against other aphid uh, insect pests and then uh, being used also for, for, for doing breeding. Uh, we work with uh, our colleagues in Morocco in, uh, on another center similar to CIMIT, which is uh, ICARDA, uh, to evaluate for Russian wheat aphid, Hessian fly, and uh, wheat stem so fly. As final remarks, I just like to, to, to mention that uh, our resistance sources, we were able to then identify resistance sources to different aphid uh, or insect pests, but uh, more resistance and broadening this genetic diversity is very important because we really don't know, in many cases, what is the, uh, the patterns of virulence and avirulence uh, of this pest for different uh, germplasms. And also for breeding, it's very important to have more, more options uh, when it comes to resistance. Uh, we also uh, were able to identify tools that can fit into in a breeding strategy without sacrificing uh, the selection of other traits or basically uh, without uh, losing genetic progress uh, for other traits. Uh, when I say other traits, I mean yield potential, stability, resistance to durable resistance to diseases, and uh, quality also, no? the, the five main aspects that I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, and of course, uh, when you incorporate a trait like this, you always have, uh, uh, you contribute to sustainability because you can reduce the use of insecticides in farmers' fields and also for those farmers that don't have access to insecticides, they are able to, they, they, they have some assurance that they, they, their, their plants, the varieties that they grow can be protected as compared if they didn't have this trait of insect resistance. And uh, our observations and uh, the development of our germplasm, I think uh, it has a very great potential. Uh, through CIMID, we distribute germplasm to about 89, 90 countries in the world. Uh, and uh, through this uh, international wheat improvement network, we can reach many local breeding programs in different countries and make this germplasm available. In fact, we have distributed uh, our germplasm with colleagues in the United Kingdom, in France, in Morocco, in South Africa, in India. Uh, so they can, they can use it and hopefully benefit from, from our activities based in Mexico. Thank you very much. クリス
それではセプテファニ様よろしくお願いいたします Good morning. おはようございます。It is such a pleasure for me to be here and having an opportunity to present our research that has been selected as the winner of the 2022 Japan International Award for Young Agricultural Researcher.、Uh, I am very honored in here and I would like to share our research that focuses on giving a value of the agricultural waste. Uh, basically, to convert them into the cellulose as a material that can be used into the various applications. So, one of the resources that we use of the waste is come from the palm oil industry. So, Indonesia is one of the largest producers of palm oil in the world. And no wonder that this industry p l a y a big important role in t o our society, economy, and environment. And the challenge Uh, still remains,、uh, especially、uh, regarding the waste management, because every time during the production of palm oil, it will leave behind a massive amount of the solid waste. And even the amount is more higher than the amount of the main community palm oil itself. So, our research focusing on transforming this、uh, waste, solid waste, from the oil palm waste. Into the cellulose, either micro scale or nano scale, using the biorefinery that can be used into the various a p p l i c a t i o n Of course, this will drive to the circular economy. So, cellulose is by far is the most abundant resource s of biopolymer on the earth. And we, if we can transform this agricultural waste into the cellulose, micro scale, or nano scale, it will create. A lot of benefits, including the important thing is the, it p o s e s the high mechanical properties, which is very good for reinforcement, the mechanical and strength of the final product. It also h a v e a reactive surface that can be easily modified with the other materials. And at some point, it also p o s e s some optical transparency that leading to easily. Applied into various applications, and of course, this is renewable, biodegradable, abundant resources that can drive into producing the eco friendly and economical viable products. And because of those advantages, that this particular cellulose material has been known as a building block, so a material that can build a various advanced product that can be applied into enormous a p p l i c a t i o n So Here are the typical p r o c e s s to produce the cellulose, microcellulose, and nanocellulose. It consists of the、uh, pulping process, consisting the delignification and bleaching process. And then, after from the, the two processes, we can produce the micro. Fiber cellulose. This microfiber cellulose is high purity cellulose because during the process we can remove most of the lignin content from the agricultural waste. After that, we can continue to the、uh, nanocellulose production. So, depending on the process we chose, we can produce either cellulose nanocrystal or cellulose nanofiber. So, here are our developed research based p r o d u c t The first one is microcellulose from the pulping process, and then we also have the nanocellulose、uh, with type of the cellulose nanocrystal from the exit hydrolysis and the cellulose nanofiber from the mechanical treatment. So, for in the case of the microfiber cellulose, we have successfully produced large scale capacity of the microfiber cellulose. In collaboration with the industry of the palm oil in Indonesia. So, we have the capacity 100 kg per day of the palm oil waste. And also, we have a mini pilot plant with the capacity of 1 kg per day of biomass. From this process, we can produce up to 70% of the cellulose、uh, purity of microfiber cellulose. So, here you can see the closer image of the Uh, differences from b-、uh, before the process, the raw materials, and then after the process, the microfiber cellulose and the nanocellulose. So you can see from the raw material is a big bundle 
of the uh, microfibrille can be separated into the individual microfibrille after the delignification and bleaching. So after that, we can continue to the nanocellulose production using the exit hydrolysis and mechanical uh, approaches of the long entangled nanofiber using the high-speed homogenizer. So in terms of the physical properties, other physical properties such as crystallinity, we can also improve the crystallinity as well as improve the thermal stability of the cellulose after subsequent process. So here I will give a brief uh, explanation about the potential use of the cellulose as building blocks. I've been doing this research since my PhD in 2013 and continue until now. So we explore the potential use of the cellulose into uh, various applications, including environment and then biopackaging, biomedical, energy, and the electronics. So I will briefly explain uh, each of these applications. So in terms of the environment, the use of cellulose can be used to address the problem related to the contaminant of the heavy metals and then the dye contamination as well as the oil contaminants. So in the case of the heavy metals contaminants, by modifying the cellulose with the other materials such as magnetic nanoparticles or activated carbon, it can help to absorb optimally various toxic heavy metals um, and then up to 86% and even this modified cellulose can be reused up to three cycles. And secondly, in terms of the dye contaminants, the modification of cellulose can be done with the nanotitania, where during the photocatalytic reaction under the UV light, we can transform the colored dye contaminant water into the clear transparent of the water. And this uh, modified cellulose can also be used, reused up to three cycle as well. So we also have started to do the oil absorption uh, contaminants uh, by modify the aerogel based on polyphenol alcohol with the nanocellulose as well to improve the oil absorption capacity after the incorporation of the cellulose. So second one is the biopackaging. As we know that our planet is choking on plastic and most of the plastic come from the biopackaging, come from the packaging, I mean. So it is very important to find a solution and use only by bio packaging. In that case, our the use of cellulose can help to produce the excellent strengths of the bio packaging. Uh, and if you can see in the table, even the mechanical properties much better than the mechanical properties of the styrofoam, the synthetic packaging. And in terms of the biodegradability, of course, this will be easily degraded into the environment in a very short period of time. So next is a biomedical application. This is quite careful application that need to be handled because uh, this one related to the biomedics. And the use of nanocellulose, mostly we are transforming the cellulose into the hydrogel form. So hydrogel is a unique polymeric that have a capability to absorb and swell the water without dissolving by maintaining the shape and integrity. So the cellulose-based hydrogel can have a high absorption capacity up to 450 gram water per gram uh, product and also have a good compatibility with the other biomaker that make it potentially can be used as the biomedical application. So here are our pro projects. Uh, we can also uh, introducing the cellulose into the alginate hydrogel. And from this result, we can see from this uh, photograph that the incorporation of cellulose can produce a very nice shape of the hydrogel based on alginate and enhancing the mechanical properties compared to the uh, alginate hydrogel without any cellulose, as well as improve the protein release. So we also incorporate our cellulose into the starch hydrogel. From here, from the table, you can see and the graph that the incorporation of cellulose can enhance significantly the water absorption up to 500 that can be used in the agriculture or even, even duct delivery application. 
So we also have the collaboration recently, since 2020, with the Politecnico di Torino, Italy. Here we're using the advanced technique, using the digital light processing to produce 3D printed of the cellulose hydrogel with the sophisticated and accurate geometry. And by using the cellulose, we can improve significantly as well the mechanical properties of the 3D printed hydrogel and uh, with the sophisticated geometry, this type of the application can be applied into the advanced applications such as tissue engineering and soft robotics. The fourth one related to the application of the electronics. So we can produce a very transparent of the nano paper that is made 100% of the palm waste cellulose. From here, we can produce a very excellent mechanical properties compared to the micro, uh, conventional micro paper with a very good uh, flexibility and transparency that can be applied into the electronic application. And the five uh, application is the energy. So the use of cellulose can also be used as energy uh, generation as well as as the energy uh, conservation. So in the case of the energy conservation, the use of the cellulose can be incorporated into the polyurethane foams that can be used as the insulated building. So by incorporating the cellulose, it can enhance the thermal insulation, meaning that it can reduce the electricity cost for heating and air conditioning. So this one is really a promising solution for reducing the total energy consumption that come from the building. And from the table, you can see also that the use of cellulose can also improve the mechanical properties, meaning it can longer the lifetime use of the PU panel insulation building. So the other application in energy is the energy generation. So we can use the cellulose nanopaper and combine with the photobiocatalyst as the energy generation. From this uh, research, we show that the incorporation of the biocatalyst into the cellulose nanopaper can help improve the sensitivity as well as the power density to generate the energy even compared to the commercial substrate from indium tin oxide substrate. So to conclude our research up to now that the oil palm biomass has been successfully produced into the cellulose material, showing the promising result to be applied into various applications. Owing to the excellent properties and then cost-effective process, and even we use the natural resources from this, supported by the multidisciplinary collaboration, we can develop the cellulose that not only address the problem related to the uh, amount of the waste in the oil palm industry, but also create innovative product that can help to be improve into applied into various applications to support the sustainable development goals in our world. So to end this application, again, I would like to thanks to my institute, National Research and Innovation Agency, and also all the collaborators from industry and university in Indonesia and international collaborator as well. And again, I would like to thanks to Japan International Award for Young Agricultural Researcher from the Ministry of the Agriculture, Forestry and Fishery in Japan, as well as JIRKAS, Japan International Research Center for Agricultural Sciences. Thank you very much for this recognition and all to the audience. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Arigato gozaimasu. <laughs> 3年の受賞者の皆様による素晴らしいご講演をいただきました。ありがとうございました。それでは以上をもちまして、2022年若手外国人農林水産研究者表彰を終了いたします。本日はご参加誠にありがとうございました。引き続きまして、隣の会場で
なおこちらの会場はジルカス国際シンポジウムの準備のためクローズさせていただきます大変お手数をおかけいたしますがお荷物はお持ちになって一旦ご退場をお願いいたしますまたご退室の際は同時通訳レシーバーは必ず受付にご返却をお願いいたしますジルカス国際シンポジウムはこの後12時30分のご入場を予定しております会場準備が整いましたらスタッフがお声がけいたしますのでご移動くださいそしてここでお帰りの皆様にご案内いたします受付でお渡しいたしました名札はホールの受付スタッフまでご返却いただきますようお願い申し上げますそれではお忘れ物などございませんようお確かめの上お気をつけてお帰りまたはご移動をお願いいたします本日は誠にありがとうございました